Well, welcome back. Uh, I, I hope you're well. I am going to um, pick up from the topic that I have been covering um, over the past two sessions, in which I, I posed the question. The question was, were you prepared? Were you trained? Were you equipped with the necessary understanding, knowledge, wisdom required for a successful relationship? In the prior two sessions, I, I began the process of going through some initial foundation blocks uh, that should be considered. In today's session, I, I would like to expand on the discussion and the conversation, um, but I, do, I would like to do so in a way that I think perhaps uh, will be long lasting in its effect and will cause you perhaps to, to ponder on your personal experiences. Uh, much more so than if I just told you the answers. Now I've given out a clue to what today's session will be themed around, which is questions. I am going to put forward to you some questions. The answers to these questions will help you understand whether you were fundamentally uh, equipped and prepared for relationships. To get things started, if you recall from the previous session, I talked about the way we work as human beings and how we are spiritual beings. We live in a physical body and we have an intellect and that Part of our intellectual experience takes place in our mind. We have a subconscious mind and we have a conscious mind. The subconscious mind representing the, the lower half of our mind and the conscious mind representing the upper half of our mind. I also stated, as such, as human beings, a lot of the decisions we make, a lot of the thoughts we think, the feelings we have, the habits we develop, the paradigms that control our life and our futures have been programmed like a computer that is programmed by great scientists and engineers. If you design a good program, that program could last a long, long time. But usually the computer program is developed by the best or amongst the best and you can change the program think about your computer for example or your mobile phone i know for example in my case uh, a few days ago i received an app uh, a notification informing me that i had to update reinstall the application or the app that i had on my phone i had been prevented from using the app further because the release of a new version um, and the time provided for all users to update the old version had lapsed. As a result, the manufacturers were saying, you can't use this application because what you are using is obsolete. You have to update, download, the new application because the new application is better than the old application. The update process sometimes takes place within minutes. It's something that can be done sometimes in seconds. The point being that you have people as part of a development team constantly looking for ways to improve the applications that we use on a daily basis, looking for ways to ensure the application will not work so that it can reverse engineer how it should work. And as soon as they get updates, they want to give you a better experience. So 
we have, when it comes to social media, technology, the internet, um, interconnectivity, we find that we have better experiences on a daily basis compared to the past because people are designing the program to make our experience more pleasant. Long explanation, but think about your mind and think about your lived experience. The habits, the paradigms, the value system, the principles that you have, your belief system was given to you. Someone designed or installed that program in you. And for most of us, the actions we take are not actions that we would like um, and are not outcomes that we wish for ourselves. Sometimes we find ourselves saying, I don't know why I keep doing the same thing, although I do not enjoy or like the outcomes. There's one simple reason why we feel that way. Subconsciously, we are doing things without our conscious mind thinking. So, in yesterday's uh, session, I, I explained that you could be taught something explicitly. Like the way I am teaching you now is explicit teaching. If you applied space repetition over time, if you agree with what I'm sharing, some of the knowledge will become part of your consciousness. And therefore you would change your behavior in line with the new belief system. On the other hand, you can be taught implicitly as part of your childhood, the environment you're raised in, what you've observed, the energy in the environment. You can be taught and trained by action rather than by words. In other words, you observe your parents, friends, loved ones, your community behave in a certain way and you emulate the people involved. To begin the process of understanding whether you were trained, equipped, prepared for a successful relationship, we have to start from the bottom. And that means uh, re-evaluating your childhood process, stages, period, to understand what ideas, what values, what model examples were provided to you and therefore will always control your outcomes relationally irrespective of what you listen to or what you hear. The reason being you have years, thousands of hours of programming. So listening to a half hour conversation with me is bound to do very, very little. To start the process, I'm going to simply ask you questions. Now I put together an initial set of 10 questions that I would like to ask you. The answers to these questions will enable you to get an understanding of where you stand from the training perspective on a subconscious level. There will be other questions to follow, but I think the first 10 will help in understanding where you stand. Question one. Now, I should stay, I should begin as follows. I'd like you to perhaps um, make a note of the questions and make a note in written form of your answers so that you can actually go back and review your initial, your initial responses. Number one, where your parents were your parents married? Were your parents married? Number two, was your father at home during your early childhood and up to 18? Was your father at home 
junior and early childhood and up to the age of 18 in your case. The reason I've connected both is it's possible your parents were married or separated. Married but lived in two different cities, villages, towns, states. It's possible they were married but one, one of them passed away and therefore one wasn't available. Were your parents married? Was your father present during your early childhood up to age 18? Question number three is did your father and was your father responsible for making the major decisions in the house, in the home, both privately and publicly? Now I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that your father had to decide what you had for breakfast, the clothes you wore to school, but the major decisions. Did you feel as a young person, as a child, um, as a teenager, did you feel that dad was the one who called the shots at home? Or did, was it the opposite? Did you feel that decisions were made by mum? Now, it's quite easy to know what the answer to that question should be. For example, if you were out with your mother or mum and a decision had to be made, did you hear her say often, well, we need to check with your father. We need to check with dad. We need dad's approval. Let's see what daddy thinks. Whenever you came up and said, can I have this? Mum, can I do this? Mum, can I stay over with my girlfriends? Mum, can I do a sleepover with my, my cousin? Mum, can I go to this place for two days? Mum, can I have this? The question is, was the response usually predictable? And did it contain any of the following sentences? Let's see what your father has to say. We have to speak to your dad first. Did you ask your dad? I'm going to have to tell your father what you said. Now, question number four. Did your father have a masculine frame? Now, I should define this and make it very clear. Did your father have a masculine frame? Now, a masculine frame is observable when you, when you see it. And when you feel it, a feminine frame on a man is observable when you see it and when you feel it. This particular question has to do with whether your father was, a, in many ways, a boy's boy. Um, was he allowed to accentuate, did he accentuate his masculinity or was he feminized did you did you have one of these fathers who um, often spoke spoke more like your, a, a woman and more like your mother than he did a man um, did he exhibit traits of fear um, lack of risk taking did you hear him argue with your mother too often? Did he talk a lot with you and with your mother? Did you find that your father cried whenever you watched movies with him and cried with your mother listening to a documentary, watching a documentary, reading a book? Um, did you find that your father had a softness about him? A softness that perhaps you often found to be cringy. Um, was he a father? Was he that solid rock that you needed? Or was he like a best friend and someone you could speak to about any and everything, including your intimate experiences with boys and men? And you could do so without fear or without caution 
because Dan was um, understanding. Now, question number five. Did you play with your father? And let me qualify that statement about play. A lot of young girls, and this has been my experience and my observation, most young girls do not play with their fathers. Most young boys do not play with their fathers. But particularly for young women, the first time they play with men is always and usually foreplay. They never got the opportunity to rough and tumble play or rough house, um, run around with dad, take risks, climb trees, do adventurous, risky things. Dad always did that with the boys, not you, the girls. Or dad was never around. Or dad had no interest in play. Play football with you. Play tag rugby with you. Pillow fight, in-house, maybe martial arts and kick, punch, um, roughhouse you, pin you down to the ground, run, um, controlled, tough play within a controlled setting. And did you have the opportunity to do so with your brothers, if you had brothers? Now, this brings me to another question. Uh, did you have, or do you have, brothers? And were you with your brothers from a, a child all the way up to 18? And did you have good, close relationships with your brothers? Now that is question number seven, or question number six. Question number seven would come in, and it's a condition. Were your parents divorced? See, I have asked you questions from one to six. And number seven is perhaps going a step further. I'm aware that most young people these days um, are born into either broken families, single parent families, um, or families where there's been a, sadly, a, uh, a loss of life, a loss of a loved one. So. Whatever form that that comes in, the question number seven is, if your parents were divorced, who had, or if your parents were separated, or if your parents never lived together, who had primary custody of you and your siblings? Was he a mother or was he a father? Now, if the answer is your mother, were you raised? And what was the ratio of time spent with dad and time spent with mom? Roughly, but on a weekly basis. You can aggregate that for the whole year. Was it 80% with mom and 20% with dad? Or was it 50-50? Now, question number eight. Um, for those of you who were lucky, and I say that um, from a positive place because it is good fortune to have, but for those of you who were lucky to have had both parents in the same house, did you observe mum speak favourably about father and dad? Did she, did she brag about him? Did she praise him, speak about him in positive languages, both privately and publicly? Um, did, you grow, did you grow up thinking or seeing the admiration that your mother had for your father and how she spoke about him in a, forgive me for using this reference, in a godlike fashion? In a, uh, in a in a way that she was looking perhaps up to him as a as a, as her lord, the way we would say in in um, uh, 
in the British uh, aristocracy and monarchy, you know, his lordship, that she looked to him and serve him as a, and therefore communicates her words of endearment and affirmation and, and reverence for him in a manner that caused you to look at your father differently. We see for women, generally speaking, and for boys, your father is just your father. But remember, your father is your mother's spouse, husband, partner, lover, and therefore she has spent more time, if they are still together, she spent more time with him than you've had the opportunity to enjoy him. And she's seen him over different years and seasons and cycles. And therefore, some women have a reverence and admiration to speak very highly of their men privately and publicly. So the question is, did you observe your mother speaking about your father um, in such ways? Um, question number eight. Did you observe your mother serving your father? And by serving, I'm referring to um, within the context of the home, whether that be cooking and serving a meal on a table, preparing the table. Um, you see, presentation, and this is perhaps the best way to describe whether your mother served your father properly. Presentation is key. Presentation in most cases is everything. If you were to come down into central London and I took you to the back of some of the streets in central London where we have some of the best restaurants in the world, the Michelin star restaurants, what you find is that the food that is placed in the, in the garbage containers, in the refuse sacks, is no different from the food that was served an hour earlier, two hours earlier, for 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 700 pounds, in a beautiful side dish or plate um, to guests. To customers. Same food. One difference. Presentation. One was prepared and presented in an elegant way and the other because there was little or no value per se was simply dumped in the refuse bins. So what we serve to the pigs and the dogs and the mice and the mouse and the rats it's the same as we serve to the wealthy. Presentation is the only difference. So, as part of servanthood, did you observe your mother take time to prepare the meal and serve the meal, preparing the table lovingly, not in bad faith, not in a grudging way, but lovingly with excitement, with happiness, for your father did you observe that and did all of you break bread share a meal together and when you were having a meal did you observe your mother serving your father or were the plates simply put on the table and everyone took his or her plates and everyone served themselves did mom serve dad and were you expected to serve your brothers if you had brothers or then mom serve your brothers and then serve you very important question and some of these questions do, are not necessarily um, easy to answer immediately you might have to think um, which is why I, I decided this could be a useful way um, um, a useful way for you to 
think about your subconscious training or the lack thereof. Question number 10, I believe. Um, did you observe your mum and your dad express affection towards each other? Did you expect, observe your mum and your dad express disagreements publicly in your midst, not privately behind the doors? Did you observe them disagree about issues? And here is the most important. Did you observe your father and your mother reconcile lovingly? You see, the question is not whether you love each other. That should, that should be a given. The more important question is, do you disagree? Because a couple that disagree, and even often, but in a controlled way, is similar to a pot or what we call a pressure cooker where some of the steam is allowed to, to come out without causing damage. But when they disagreed, did you see one or both parties hold a, a grudge for days and weeks and for them to go not speaking to each other for hours, days, weeks? Did you see one person's behavior change during the disagreement phase, for example, they were they had an argument for four hours, and that four hour gap period before they reconciled coincided with lunchtime, and mum decided I'm not serving lunch. And therefore, perhaps you just had to have biscuits and, and uh, had you had the leftovers of the bread and dad had to fend for himself. You see, the most important part of the, the three part question is whether you observed reconciliation and how you can reconcile lovingly and how you should never allow the relationship to be at stake for a disagreement. You see, sometimes our views and our beliefs, we can be really wedded to our views and beliefs, so much so that irrespective of The location in society whenever the beliefs that people hold too closely are seen as the most important um, the relationship is usually at stake at the core of that three-part question and which i will pick up in the next session is the word ego and with ego and as i come into the next session. I'll be, I will be talking about humility, good faith, communication, forgiveness, gratitude, um, attentiveness. And I'm going to bring all of those things together in a, in a manner that may be similar to today, but will cause you to evaluate your life and your experiences. See, all of the questions that I've asked you today, and perhaps this is my closing statement, all of the questions that I asked you today, let's assume you answered positively to all of the questions. In other words, you scored out of the 10, you scored 10. Don't get too confident, don't gloat in your upbringing. And the reason is simple. Conscious, subconscious mind, but all of these questions only make up a fraction of what could potentially be your success equation. Even if you answered 10 of the questions correctly, or it was in your favor in each of the instances, at best it, it makes up for, in my opinion, less than 15%. I would give it 10% of the success that you could have it's not guaranteed that you could have in your relationship. It plays a, an important role, but it's not all that is needed, which is why you meet friends, you have friends, you may know people who 
two-parent family, loving father, great man, perhaps was a coach in a football team, loved by the, the students, the community, loved by other women, loved his wife, was catered to by his wife. You saw everything, everything. But you yourself find it incredibly difficult to choose correctly, to maintain a relationship or to find happiness. Now, I hope all of what we've discussed today has been useful. Um, come back tomorrow. And if you haven't subscribed, please do but come back tomorrow because I will be talking about uh, what could be p p potentially uh, a pivotal and an important um, conversation that I would hope will guide you towards finding what you want in your relationship.